Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Corinthians. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We study verse by verse, uh, typically here on occasion we'll take a break and do a special topical message, but we're continuing our study here through the book of 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 11, and today we uh, plan to deal with verses 5 to 12. Stand with me if you're able, if not you can remain seated. And follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 5, where the Scripture says, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them who desire occasion, that in that which they glory, they may be found even as we. Father, we ask that you lead us and guide us through the Scripture, through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. May we understand that which you give to us today through your power and your ability and not our own uh, understanding. Father, uh, we ask that as you give us these truths, Father, that you would embolden us not only to receive them, and to understand them, but to go forward and proclaim them to others. We'll give you praise and thanks for all that you'll do here in our midst this morning, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. Hear me clearing my throat every once in a while. I do not have COVID. Uh, I have an allergy that uh, seems to be lingering on. Uh, The end of almost two years worth now for some reason. I don't know why, but it can't seem to shake. <clears throat> a little bit. So bear with me, if you will, as I sort of uh, cough a little here and there and try to clear my throat in order to, to, to talk about the, the, the word of the Lord. We're continuing our study here about false apostles, false apostles. Uh, and it's no different today than it was then, except it may be worse. Uh, We understand it's going to, Paul wrote to the young pastor Timothy and said in the last days it's going to wax worse and worse. And what that means is that the false teachers will become more skillful and better able to deceive. The devil is the great deceiver. And so we want to talk today uh, in the bulletin you'll see an outline of the message about the deception of appearance. The deception of appearance. Uh, We talked last week, and I'll just briefly go through uh, the essence of that, which is beneficial for our pickup at this point in 2 Corinthians. If you just go and read these verses and take them out of context, you may be lost. That's why it's so important to always take Scripture and deal with it verse by verse. So when you get to the end of it, you know what it says. Otherwise, you can take any verse of Scripture or any few verses of scripture and almost say anything you want about it that might be believable to people. We want to we want to draw the truth out of God's word today. And what we talked about last week in the first four verses of this chapter were threats, 
threats to our absolute devotion to the Lord. And uh, in verse 2, you'll look there, I, we identified the threat of impurity. Paul said at the end of verse 2, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The purity, uh, not being uh, intoxicated by the wickedness of this world, if you will. And in verse 3, we talked about the threat uh, of disloyalty. There, you'll see in verse 3, at the end of the verse, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That word simplicity means sincerity, and a, a really good word for this is unaffected, unaffected, unaffected by the world, unaffected by, and of course, the false apostles were trying to undermine Paul's ministry. They were trying to tear him down and disprove him as an apostle altogether, and they tried to undermine the truths that he was speaking by telling the lies and hypocrisy that they were propagating all along, operating as Jesus told the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, that who thought that Abraham was their father, and Jesus told them, Abraham is not your father, the devil is your father. When's the last time you told somebody that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, Jesus has perfect knowledge, but there might be an occasion we could use that in the presence of somebody when we're fully aware as God gives us understanding because he does. Uh, John said in 1 John chapter 4, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether or not they confess the Lord. So we understand uh, as, as mature Christians what a Christian should look like and how they should believe. When somebody says they're a believer and they don't look anything like it by way of their life, something's wrong. Jesus did that to the Pharisees and says, you're of your father, the devil. And he's the, he's the liar and the father of lies. He's the great deceiver. We're fighting in Philippians. It tells us that we, in Ephesians, we, Ephesians said we have this, this spiritual warfare that's going on continually. It never ceases for the believer. It never ceases. We are battling with the devil and his cohorts every day. The devil and his demons are our adversary, not flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. And so spiritual battles can only be undertaken by the word of God. That's our offensive weapon. Uh, as we look at that in Ephesians 6, I'm not going to turn there, but the sword of the Lord, the, the word of God is our weapon. When, when the devil came and tempted Jesus three times after he was in the wilderness 40 days, Jesus used the word of God against the devil. Well, if Jesus used it, shouldn't we? Amen. And we can't use it unless we know it. We can't know it unless we study it. Study, study, study. Now, the threat of disloyalty that uh, Paul was urging the people at Corinth to be unaffected by the heresy that the false apostles were teaching. And then in verse 4, we talked about the threat of gullibility. Gullibility. We're gullible for just about anything. It seems if somebody gets up, and we're gonna, this is a good segue to our message today. If somebody gets up and they have polished speech, and they have charisma of some kind, they just seem believable. You ever see people, they just seem so believable. You know who the most believable of all people is? The devil. And he's not a person, but he is a spirit because he's an angel that fell from heaven because of his pride, the original sin. And what we find is that he is trying to deceive. He's trying to deceive every one of us. So we're talking about this deception, if you will, the, the impurity, the, the disloyalty, the gullibility, if you will. In verse 4, Paul wrote, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, little s, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might bear well with him. Paul was telling them, you're putting up with these people. They come in and preach another Jesus, another gospel, and you're giving credence to that. You're listening to that. He seems believable to you. These false teachers are trying to deceive you. 
And of course, we have this characterization, characterization of these false teachers over here in verse 14. And no marvel. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised. It happens regularly. It's commonplace occurrence. It happens in many pulpits in our nation and around the world uh, on the Lord's Day. It says, No marvel, for Satan himself has transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, and particularly Paul is referring to these false apostles that were trying to undermine Paul's apostleship and his authority that God had given to him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and how they were trying to tear that down, they're false apostles. But it applies to everybody who teaches something other than what the Bible says. And the only way we're going to know is if we be like the Berean believers and we read what this says, we hear what they say, and then we get into the scriptures ourselves and we study to see whether or not it's true. Don't believe it just because somebody who seems to be believable said it. Just because they have a position in a church, just because they have a degree behind their name, just because they're a polished speaker does not make them believable by way of the scriptures, because they have to be consistent with the scriptures in order to be believable. The problem is we're too gullible. We talked about the threat of gullibility. So today we want to talk about the deception of appearance. The deception of appearance. And we want to take a look at this first in verses 5 to 6, the beginning of our reading here. And I call this the appearance of professional speech. Oh boy. The appearance of professional speech. You know what I mean when I say professional speech. There are a lot of people, when they speak, you say, wow. And we do this, that wow factor to a lot of people who have eloquence in their speech. And they're very articulate, and they have a great vocabulary, and they get very nimble and spontaneous, if you will. And they articulate their ideas an ideology as they want. You know, the, the problem is the, the false teachers here, the false apostles were teaching heretically. They were teaching heresy. Heresy is a word that is, seems to be mysterious to many people. Heresy simply means opinion. Opinion. Uh, philosophy is a study of opinions. Well, philosophy becomes heretical teaching because philosophy deals with philosophical things, not with theological things. And I'm talking about real theological things out of the scriptures. So if you're dealing with man's ideas and man's concepts and man's precepts and man's thoughts around things, you're dealing with philosophy. Psychology is another one. And I can speak of that. My undergraduate degree is in psychology. That and this cup of water, eh, it won't even get you a cup of coffee, right? But it's not worth much. It's not worth much because it's what people think. I was talking to somebody this morning. You know, when I was studying psychology in college, they were, they were trying to make that a science. Well, it's no more a science than this pulpit is. It's thoughts about what happens in the minds of people. And so they take and they, you know, it's like today, they want to profile people who are mass murderers. They want to profile them. And every time I hear that, I ask, why do they want to profile them? What are they going to do with that knowledge? They want to know what that person acts like, what that person thought before the event happened. Are you going to go out and take people who think like that and you're going to put them in jail so they can't commit crimes? No, nobody's going to do that. It's all a waste of time to try to profile somebody. We understand that it's wickedness. It's a cause. It's not guns. It's not knives. It's wickedness in the hearts of people. That's the crime. And the real crime is people not knowing Christ. That's the real crime. Of course, there's a lot of things we've legalized in our country. <clears throat> we haven't made knowing Christ illegal, but I believe they're going to try to do it one day. And the way things are going, I would not be surprised. But this appearance of professional speech in verse 5 Paul says, for I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. Now, it's interesting because the word wit means nothing. It means nothing. Literally, the meaning of the word wit there. And as we look at this, 
or no one. He said, I was not a nobody behind the very chiefest apostles. What he's trying to say is, I was in no way inferior to these false teachers. Because he's talking about the chiefest apostles. Chiefest is a word that means eminent. Uh, Many scholars have rephrased this to call them super apostles. Because that's what they think about themselves. Some people, some people believe that this refers to the 12 apostles, but it just does not refer to the 12 apostles. The beginning of this and the end of this, the text that falls around this verse clearly demonstrates Paul's talking about false, false apostles. And the apostles did not think they were imminent. That's not what they thought. But the false apostles thought they were the best. They thought they were the best. Remember, we studied earlier in this book how that they, 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 they commended each other and they measured each other. And that's how they, they standardized their professionalism, if you will. We we're talking about their professional speech. They measured each other by each other. They didn't measure themselves by the word of God. They didn't measure themselves by the gospel. It was just whether or not they were professional in their presentation and in other aspects of their so-called ministry because they were in ministry. These false apostles had established their own legitimacy. They established their own legitimacy, which was illegitimate in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the people. And the Corinthians were gullible enough to listen to them and because they had such great speech. Paul says here, in verse 5, he says, I suppose I was not a wit. I was not, I was not inferior to these false apostles behind the very super, if you will, or eminent or chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, but though I be rude in speech, <clears throat> uh, look back to chapter 10 and verse 10 for a second before we finish that thought. Chapter 10 and verse 10. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. He said, for, uh, and this, uh, for his letters say they. We clarified and pointed out and demonstrated how the they here referred to the false apostles. The false apostles were the ones who said this. For his letters, the false apostles were saying, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. In other words, he's not a good speaker. He's not a good speaker. Uh, contemptible there if you means it means worthless his speech is worthless that's what they thought because he and Paul admits over in chapter 11 and verse 5 he says though I be rude in speech and rude and rude there means I'm just a simple person I'm just a simple person I don't have eloquence in speech I don't have that that's not what God gave me God gave me the ability and the and the power through the Uh, the Holy Spirit, to teach the gospel, to proclaim the gospel. And in fact, God used Paul to reveal much of the gospel that we have to us. They were mysteries in the Old Testament, but they've become a reality in the New Testament. So Paul here says that I was rude in speech. I was rude in speech. Now, look back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17, <clears throat> Paul had talked to them about this already. You know, soon how people forget. Maybe some of us forgot when we studied 1 Corinthians since then, if we will. But in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay, so God sent me to preach the gospel. Oh, he clarifies that. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In other words, not because of my ability to be eloquent in speech, else you would give me credit. Well, that's what the false apostles wanted. They wanted credit. They wanted to be lifted up on high. They wanted to be in the limelight. They wanted to be the ones that people followed. They didn't like the fact that they were following Paul. They didn't like that. 
He was just a crude guy who was running around, didn't know what he was talking about, according to them. Of course, he had a lot of followers. He had established churches, and they were going into the churches he established and trying to undermine Paul's authority and his, and his ministry to try to drag those people. And, of course, they're under the auspices of the devil himself, and we understand the devil has transformed them into ministers of light. So those very apostles that were considered to be apostles by the people of the church and people outside the church, they considered them to be on equal footing with Paul by way of authority as an apostle. But how much better did they look because they had eloquence in speech? They were professionals. They were professionals. And so if you were to go out and, and sample five churches, Paul's church was, isn't the one you're going to pick. You're going to go to that polished church where it looks like the person knows what they're talking about and how much better they've presented. You know, God told, um, God told the, uh, you know, God said at one time, he said, don't judge. You know, when he's trying to pick David out as a king and he's trying to get Samuel to do that, he says, don't judge. Because Samuel paraded in all of Jesse's sons except for David, and said, well, there's nobody left. <laughs> oh, there was one left. But it's not somebody on the outward appearance that Samuel or anybody else would have considered to be king material. Don't judge by the outward appearance. We go to churches and we say, huh, well, that guy doesn't sound like what he's talking about. Be careful. Be careful. Because there's a deception, and I call it here the deception uh, which is the appearance of professional speech. It's all too true in our society today. There are people that garner huge crowds because they have the ability. You know, one of the reasons, and you've heard my story many times, I fought the Lord for three years, a call to the ministry. I fought it for three years. And I'm not trying to brag or anything. I'm just giving you reality. The reason that I fought the Lord three years in my mind, I was convinced I'm not the person you want in the ministry. I'm deceiving myself. Oh, yeah, I got saved. I was teaching a Sunday school class, you know, uh, the kids, and I was studying, I was learning, and I know I was saved by the grace of God, and, I'm, and I, I feel like I'm doing pretty good, but I did not feel like, because I did not have the ability, of course, back in those days, uh, God has done a work in my heart. I couldn't talk in a group of people, much less in front of a an audience this size or any size. And that was proven in my senior year of, of college when I took a course called the Planetarium. Little did I realize that the final exam was I had to present, a, 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 I had to present at the Planetarium a program uh, attended by the public at the tune of 250 people. And so when I got into the I got into, uh, got into the observatory. I go in there, it's like, oh, wow, this place is full. And you know, they're round. So people are all around. And I'm in the center, and I had, I had everything detailed out. I had every word written down I was going to say. One thing I forgot, and you know, I'm the one at the controls, is you got to turn the lights down in order to see the stars in a planetarium. I couldn't see the words on the page. I didn't set up a light to, to see that. I embarrassed myself because I, I didn't have the ability to speak. And I know that. And I did get a C for the class because I'd done a lot of better work, but I did not get a good grade on that final exam. I think the teacher was merciful, and I'm thankful for that. But I, I, I fought the Lord because later on, when, it, when I, I, I sensed he was calling me, I was like, no, I'm not the one. I called it the gift of gab. So, Lord, I don't have the gift to gab. I can't get up in front of a group of people. You know, I don't go to a party. I'm the guy that sits in the corner and doesn't say anything to anybody because I just wasn't a person that would like to speak in front of groups. Two or three people, that's fine, but five or six? I mean, I took a class called Small Group Communications just to keep from having to give speeches. I had a speech class in English. I took small, where I had to speak in a group of five or six. I had struggled with that. And I reminded the Lord of that. For three years, I said, I'm not material. Not much different than Moses, right? And uh, the Lord finally got a hold of my heart, and I said, yes. And my first sermon, I prepared it, wrote it, wrote it all out, and it didn't work. Everybody was gracious and kind. I knew it wasn't good. And from that point on, I haven't written a sermon. 
write a few notes and that's it. It's extemporaneous and spontaneous. But the Lord at that point gave me the ability to speak in front of a crowd. And you might not know it, but I know it from personal experience. But God gives that. Paul was effective. And I, if you listen to me on the radio, you hear ahs and ands and all kinds of extraneous material that you don't hear from polished speakers on the radio. A lot of good polished pe preachers out there, and, and they're very well uh, with their oration skills. I'm not one that way. But what I do know is I know the scriptures are the truth, and God gave me the ability to understand them and to talk about them. And that's what we're doing today. But the polished speech is not a sign. Don't judge on the outward appearance. But you know, churches are filled today with people who are doing just that. People are being drawn away out of churches to go to mega churches where there's great skill. In order, I mean, you got to be top line in order to be a preacher in one of those. I would not qualify. I give you right up front. I would not qualify. I would not. For more than one reason. That's one of them. <clears throat> but <clears throat> in verses 5 and 6, what we find is Paul warns them about the appearance, in effect, my words are, of professional speech. Professional speech. Paul said, though I'm crude... Rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. Remember, Paul, what Paul gave to us, most of it was revelation. Had never even been taught before. God gave that to him. He called him to be a preacher to the Gentiles. And he went to the Gentiles and he, he, re, he, he brought to mind the things that were hidden in the Old Testament. And revealed to us the plan of salvation. Revealed to us how we ought to live our Christian life. So we understand that from verse 6 there. He says, yet not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Here we are. There's no pretense, Paul says. I am what I am and you got what you got. That's it. Second point in verses 7 to 9 and that is <clears throat> another deception of appearance is the appearance of professional support. Support, I'm talking about salary. Talking about salary. You know, Paul was a tent maker. Anybody knows the scriptures knows Paul was a tent maker. There was a reason Paul was a tent maker. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't just something that he wanted to do. It's something that he did, if you will. If you look back over to uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 14. <clears throat> In the verses prior to this, Paul laid out that preachers should live by the word. They're entitled to that. They're entitled to live uh, as a preacher and be supported by the congregations that they uh, minister to. In verse 14, though, he says, Even so, even so, that's true. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. That means they should be supported by the ministry that they are in. In verse 15, but. <clears throat> the word but is a very effective word that Paul uses often. I know the world hates the word but because it sounds negative right up front. Paul says, but I, he's talking about himself here. I'm not talking about anybody else. <clears throat> I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. And if against my will a dispensation, that's a stewardship of the gospel, is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. That means I do it for free, that I may, that I abuse not my right in the gospel. The right, <clears throat> he had the privilege, he had the authority, he had the right to draw a salary <clears throat> and to be supported by the church at Corinth. 
He said, I choose not to do that. And the reason I choose not to do that is so that people don't think that I'm in it for the money. As we go back to our text, the false apostles, as we know, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, they're, they're, uh, and Peter talked about it. They're making merchandise of the churches. They're making merchandise. <clears throat> they're getting fat and happy and rich and wealthy and well at ease by using the church to draw a big salary. It's a business. I was listening to a dialogue three or four days ago on the radio. <clears throat> There's a lot of fallout about the Southern Baptist Convention and this guy who's been guilty of plagiarism, right? And they were talking about some of the issues around the leadership of the Southern Baptist Convention that we're not a part of. But part of that uh, discussion, uh, the man who was a leader in the Southern Baptist Convention, he says, you know, <clears throat> And he's talking about a lot of people who are abusing their office. He says, he says, the church today is more of a business than it is anything else. And those words just struck me. That the church today is a business. Mary and I went to a church, and Trace, <clears throat> our son, we went to a church, <clears throat> and Richard went there too, <clears throat> our other son, <clears throat> excuse me, went to a church locally, Big uh, independent Baptist church. Went there for almost a year. And we finally got inside to find out what's really going on below the surface. Because the ministry can look, boy, it looks great on the surface. But you got to find out what's going on inside. And when we did, we left. <clears throat> but one of the things that they were doing, the reason we left is because the pastor brought a group of people in, about 40 or 50 of them, and says, you folks aren't getting enough salvations we're down by whatever the number was. I don't remember. You're down by 30% this year. And this was like late in the year, like November. We've got to get out there. We've got to get more people saved. I'm thinking, the Lord saves people. These people, you know. But he, he was challenging them. And he told them, you've got to get out there and tell people. And ask them that question. Do you know if you're going to go to heaven? If you die today? <clears throat> And if you don't know, do you want to know? Would you like to go to heaven? And then read them a couple of scriptures. They pray after me and say, boy, we got one more. We put them on a roll. They got a number up there. They were all about the numbers. A side of the church I had not seen for a year. Mary and I stopped. We took Trace over to the nursery. He was that age then, or at least to the Sunday school class. We're on the way back. <clears throat> the Lord had an appointment for us. And we stopped outside where you heard him. The preacher was raising his voice to these people. And we just stood there and watched and listened. The doors were open and we were just astonished. It's like, this is what's going on in this church? This is what's going on? You know, uh, reaching out and evangelizing the lost is one of our major goals. But not doing it the wrong way. But other things they were doing, they had, they had a business there. They had a number of things, bookstore, some other things in, and they were bringing in revenue from those things, selling tapes and all that stuff. And they're bringing in revenue. And I looked at all of that and I said, you know, it's not much different than a business, just a business. And you know, when I visited a church, a Second Baptist Church of uh, Houston years ago when the Congress of Biblical Exposition, huge church. They got to get a big church because we had like over a thousand pastors who went to the conference. And I, I sat down with, uh, on Wednesday night, we were there every night, Wednesday night they asked uh, uh, the people in the church who attended the Wednesday night service because they incorporated the Wednesday night service into our conference, and they asked the people who, who were members of the church, give some of these people a ride back to their hotel tonight so they won't have to catch a cab and this and that and the other. So there's a man sitting next to us, and... and uh, he was, he was a trustee in the church. 10,000 member church. He was a trustee. He was a wealthy man. <clears throat> he gave us a ride home in his Mercedes. Or a ride to the hotel in his Mercedes. He graciously, uh, the three of us, asked us to, uh, that he could do that. But uh, his business was he, was, he owned a distillery. He owned a distillery. And you know, I remember after being saved not very long, uh, I was changing jobs and I went and, and interviewed and it's like, 
one of the restaurants I interviewed with, they really wanted me to work there. It was called Steak and Ale at the time. It was a nationwide chain. They wanted me to go be a manager. And I said, well, what does it take to be a manager? Da, 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 da. Oh, there's alcohol. You have to manage the alcohol. Nope, can't do that. I'm not going to be involved in it. Not going to handle it. Not going to sell it. Not going to be a part of the process that sells it so that people get inebriated and drunk. Not going to do it. But here's a guy who's a trustee in a church and he owns a distillery. And it just blew my mind. And of course, they had restaurants, fitness centers, they had swimming pools, tennis courts, racquetball courts, everything else you can imagine. Restaurant and drawing in money. They had several restaurants in the church, drawing in the money. It's a business. I wonder how much we've turned the church into a business today. Paul says the professional support of these false apostles was they were being paid. Their goal was money, money, money. Look at verse 7 here. It says, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself, that is humbling myself, that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely without charge? I robbed other churches. Use of hyperbole here. He didn't rob anybody. It's a use of hyperbole. Remember, and um, it says in verse 9, uh, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied some of his needs. Well, remember the people at Macedonia? If you don't, look back at chapter 8 and verse 1, where it says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you uh, the, gospel, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their, of their joy and their deep poverty, they abounded under the riches of their liberality. They were so poor, and they yet gave so abundantly beyond their capability. And they gave a gift to Paul. Paul was honest about things. They gave me a gift. And he says, his idea was, it's almost like I robbed the church. Because they couldn't afford to give me money, but they did. Paul didn't take money from the churches where he was, was actively ministering. But churches that he had been to before did send gifts to him. And so Macedonia had done that. And so his, his idea there... Um, in verse 8, as I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted or lacked, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking. He was in need. He was in want. He didn't have the basic elements that he needed. He says, um, he says for that which was lacking to me, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. I'm not going to be a burden to this church. I'm not going to accept the salary. We saw that on 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Why? He said, if I do this thing willingly, if I do it willingly, there's no reward. Or I've already got my reward. I need to do it out of necessity. Why? Because God knocked him down off that animal and said, you're going to go preach to the Gentiles. <laughs> and he did. Out of necessity. When God calls us to do stuff, we ought to feel of necessity because... It says in 1 John 5, 3 that we know that we love God when we keep his word, that we obey his word, and it doesn't become a burden to us. So we obey God, and when God tells us to do something, it's not a burden to us. We're going to go do it anyway, and we're happy about it. Truly happy, not just happy on the surface, right? So Paul here was trying to point out the error of the false apostles that they were making merchandise at the Corinthian church. And Paul says, I wasn't doing that. And he goes on uh, to say in verse 11, why? He says, wherefore, because I love you not. He says, God knoweth, and what's not said, but definitely implied is God knoweth that I do love you. He did it out of love. He did it out of love. Paul wasn't there to get anything out of it. Nothing. Paul was there to give. To give what God had given to him that he might give it to others. That's the mark of a true teacher of the word of God. Not somebody making merchandise of the church. <clears throat> and then in uh, verses 10 to 12, the appearance of professional service. And by service I mean ministry. The appearance of a professional ministry. Verse 10 as the truth of Christ is in me, in other words, truly, 
No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. See, Achaia was the province of Rome at the time. Corinth was the capital of that province. So the false apostles, the insinuation is the false apostles were spreading beyond the church at Corinth across the entire province of Achaia. And Paul was trying to stop the spread of that. He says in verse 10, as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth Literally, I do love you. But he says here, but what I do, that I, what I do, that is, I have sacrificed myself. I make tents for a living. I've received some money from other churches who have helped me, and it's minimal at best. And he says, and I'm going to keep doing that. What I do, that, I, that I'm going to continue to do is what that phrase means. Why? Why is he going to keep doing what he's been doing? That I may cut off occasion. Occasion, the word means opportunity. I may cut off opportunity from them who desire occasion or opportunity. That is the false apostles. That in that which they glory, they may be found even as we. Found even as we, that is manifested and bear before not only the Lord, but the people. Because Paul said, I haven't kept anything back from you. Here it is. Here's who I am. And what you know about me is what it is. You're not going to find any dark secrets in the closet. We've been doing this thing for the Lord. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it to make money. We're not doing it to build a business. But the false apostles are trying to build it. I wonder today how many churches are building a big business. Some churches have multi-million dollar businesses that they're operating when I went to that same church I went to down in Houston, they did not call it a church. The people in the, in, that we talked to, they called it a plant. Their brochure for the church called it our plant. It was a plant. It was a plant. It's a business. I often wondered if the guy who ran the distillery factory didn't have input into calling the church a plant. I don't know the answer to that. I often thought about it, but it's a... Church is not a business, not a business. This is spiritual enterprise, spiritual enterprise. And Paul was up against the wall with these false apostles because what had happened is, and I said the appearance of professional service was the problem is Paul was doing this. I'm going to keep doing. I'm not going to take a salary from you. And these ministers were taking salary, these false apostles. They were taking salaries. And Paul says, I want to cut off the opportunity. How does that relate? Because they no doubt were upset because Paul had quite a following and he wasn't taking a salary, making them look bad in some respect. Well, why are y'all taking a salary? He's not taking one. So Paul was going to keep doing it because it was the right thing to do. And he knew that that would put a little bit of shade on the ministry of the false apostles. Because they were out there building a business, trying to make merchandise of the people that were there. Um, now, <clears throat> a couple of things I want to say uh, in the closing here, if you will. Um, and that is, Paul's motivation was love. It was not money. You know, and I remember coming here, Pastor Lamb, who was the pastor then, uh, passed away a few years after I got here. But we didn't, my, my son and I, we, we've been looking for other churches, talking about trouble at other churches. And we come here, I mean, we, we drive by this building every day. And my son Richard said, well, why don't you go to church here? Yeah, Pee Wee Valley Baptist, a Baptist church. I said, look at the name on the sign. Thought it was a woman's name. Came inside. He said, well, let's try it anyway. Maybe it's not. Come inside. <clears throat> sure enough, pastor was not a woman. But we did find out he was a very loving man who preached the gospel. He preached the truth. And, you know, I've, I've seen a few pastors. I've been in a few churches. I haven't seen anybody that loved others like he did. And I see Paul sort of being that same way. He did it out of love. I know Pastor Lamb did it out of love. In fact, when we worked together and on, a, on several difficult issues in the transition period, uh, there, were some, there were some difficult tasks that had to be handled with the membership. And he didn't want to handle them. He didn't want to handle them. Uh, 
And I told him I'd be glad to handle them. Uh, but his disposition, and, I, and I, I jumped on those occasions because I knew he felt bad. He, he, he didn't have the heart to do it because his love for the people was so great. <clears throat> and I sort of been the bad cop many years in my work experience and learned how to deal with that. But um, love, the false apostles were in it for the money. We need to be able to discern whether or not the polished professional people who are leading churches are true teachers of God or whether or not they're just running a business and making money out of it. I say that because <clears throat> take a big church, you name the church, take a big church, prominent church, a lot of members, and they lose their pastor. They have an opening for a pastor. They get together like almost every other church. They put together a committee to search for a pastor. And they make it known that they're going to hire a pastor. And what happens? Uh, 500 resumes. Every one of them say, God's called me. <laughs> well, there's at least, if there's 500 of them, hypothetical numbers, at least 499 of them are liars. Because God's going to call one person for the one opening. Maybe all 500 of them are lying. It might likely be the case. God may not have called them. They saw the salary. You say, well, salary doesn't mean, oh, be careful. <laughs> uh, I was in human resources for many, many years. I saw people jump jobs, you know, for a buck or two an hour all the time. And they want to jump here, jump there, jump there, jump over there. Money, money, money. Money, money, money. They're working. They say, I want to make the most money I can make. And uh, not many people are in it because they like the work. I worked for the same company 28 years and then retired because I loved what I was doing. Could I have made more money? Yeah. In fact, when I retired from that company, I went to work for a company and made more money. And I could have done that before, but I wasn't interested in that because I loved what I was doing. And, and you know, I've, I've said it before, and you know it's well, but I have never taken a salary as being a pastor of a church. I never intend to, never have. Um, it's volunteer work for me. I do it for the Lord. I do it because I love doing what God called me to do. I do it out of constraint. I don't do it because it's something that I want to do. I certainly am not doing it to make any money off of it because every year I file my tax returns, uh, I am... Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm self-employed. Every pastor should be self-employed. And every year, it's a loss. It's a big loss every year. And it's the way it should be. Because being a pastor is not, mon not a monetary thing. It's not about raking in the dough. It's about serving the Lord. Serving the Lord with your heart. But these false apostles had it all wrong. And the problem is people are deceived by the appearance of the people, the appearance of the ministry, the appearance of success. You want to see success? I'll show you success in a nutshell. Jeremiah preached 30 years. Not one person. Not one person believed him. Why? Because he gave a negative message. Why was it a negative message? Because God was going to judge the people and he was going to take them out of the land that he had promised them and they were living in. So God says, because of your sin and your wickedness, I'm going to remove you from the land and take you into captivity. And they didn't want to hear the news. They didn't want to hear the truth. <clears throat> Nobody believed him. But yet it came to pass, didn't it? It did come to pass. Jeremiah did the right thing. Der Jeremiah got thrown in dungeons, was dark, and was mistreated and tortured and everything else. He could have easily changed his message to make it sound better. No. He taught the truth. Our problem is we go out on the streets in our house, in our neighborhood, in our venues of life, and we don't tell the truth enough. We make things sound rosy. I don't know who go up and say, oh, man, you want your life to be better? You need to give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be happier. You're going to have this. You're going to have that. No, it's not the case. When I used to hire first-line supervisors at Ford Motor Company, <coughs> they'd come in, <coughs> and people would tell them, oh, it's going to be a great job. You're going to earn a lot of money. 
When I got a hold of them, I said, you're going to be thrown out there to the wolves. You're going to be supervising 25 or 30 people on the line. They're going to give you a radio and a pair of safety glasses, and it's called survival of the fittest. And you're going to have to buckle down, and you're going to have to do the job in order to keep your job. You just got to do that. Because if you don't do your job, they'll throw you out, and they'll bring another one in. You got to give them the reality, and the Scripture is real. The Scripture says... <clears throat> All who, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <clears throat> We're not in it to get benefits. We're not in it for anything. We're not in it to suffer, except it is a joy to the believer to participate in the sufferings of Christ. It's a joy for us. Jesus said it right up front in his beatitude speech when he said, you know, you're going to be persecuted and you're going to suffer. You're going to be accused of all things falsely for my sake. But rejoice and be exceeding glad. Amen. Let's take the truth of God's word and go out there. <clears throat> forgetting about what the appearance looks like. Let's get down to the nitty gritty and find out whether or not. Because there are people that are flocking to bigger churches, smaller churches. Last I heard, fundamental churches are dying to the tune of about 150 a year. <clears throat> Why? Because just like in this day, the false apostles found new ways to do it. They had new ideas. They had their own theology, their own philosophy. Uh, well, it's, it's hypocrisy. They were lying to people, made things sound good. But we have people today who are building kingdoms out there. Their, 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 their appearance is deceiving. They're building businesses that are generating money, and a lot of it is for self-glory and for their own reputation. It's like the false apostles. They measure themselves by themselves, and they commend themselves with themselves. It come, becomes a group. But we've got to be careful, because God's going to hold us accountable for what we do with the truth. And the first part of that is seeking the truth. We've got to seek the truth in order to use the truth. And once we understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit being saved by the grace of God, we're going to use it for His glory and for His honor, and it doesn't matter who it hurts. doesn't matter who it hurts. Jesus told the, the religious leaders of the day, your father's the devil. Man looked at me and says, you got a black heart. We need to sometimes confront people with their sins. I didn't get convicted of my sins until... Being in church that one morning, we hadn't been for 10 years. We go one day, got, you know, uh, I don't want to get most of that stuff because the preacher was preaching the word of God. A couple of weeks later, we go back. Mary and I both got saved because the preacher was using the word of God and, the, and God was revealing all of that stuff in my life that was sinful and wicked. And I thought that it was good because I was a self-righteous individual. You got to let the word of God do a work on our heart. And the only way we can be saved is God convicts us of our sin. It's the only way we can be saved. If we just want to, oh, let's, let's, let's join the church. Let's connect to some people who are Christians. Sort of improve my life a little bit. doesn't work that way. And what we do with the truth, seek it first and then share it with others. Share the truth. And I'll say this. What do you say to people who have homosexual family members what do you say to people who have transgender family members what do you say to them you pat them on the back and good job a little sorry for you what to tell them the truth because a lot of a lot of families are wrapping their arms around all the perversions of this world because now it's in my family now it's in my family what did jesus say he said, I came not to bring peace, but I came to set man at variance against his own family. Father against mother, children against parents, parents against children, brothers against sisters, etc. Not that Christ wants the family to be at odds with each other, but he comes to set the family at, at variance with one another because the truth is what matters, not family love. The family and our house is not a haven of safety. The haven of safety is our Savior, Jesus Christ. The precious Lamb of God who shed His blood for us. And we need to understand that, that 
God cares for us and God wants to use us. And we don't want to be like Jeremiah and people scorn us all the time. We don't want that. We don't want to. So we maintain friendships. We maintain family relationships because we don't want to be the bearer of bad news. It's actually good news that people need to hear. Amen. It's not bad news. It's bad news because it puts you in a bad light, but it's good news. And if we just need to take the bull by the horns and go out and share the word of God like it is, we'll find success. God says, my word shall not return void, but it'll accomplish that which I please. Let's stand together if you will. <clears throat> Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for the truth. Father, we're thankful for your calling upon our life. We're thankful for the salvation you've given to us. And Father, as we come to the close of this message, we, we need to look at ourselves introspectively and understand if we have truly been deceived by appearances. And there are many different appearances the devil uses to deceive us. And Father, we just need to be careful understanding scripturally where we should stand on every issue and how we should stand on every issue and how we need to speak out for others because you've called us to serve you. And so, Father, may we serve you with enthusiasm and vigor in the days ahead, declaring your truth to others despite where the chips may fall, willing to participate in Christ's sufferings. And we'll give you praise and thanks for all that you'll do in and around us. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.